three, two, one. Welcome everybody to our to the South Florida State College first annual UGR showcase program and I'm Dr. James Hawker, Dean of Arts and Sciences. I'm also a scientist by training. I'm very excited for the program we've put together. I'm very proud of these students. We have multiple students from uh, arts and humanities as well as si different areas of science all worked on research projects during the past academic year and they've done some really good work. Some of the students have already presented at conferences uh, early this spring, and, like one or two of them. And there's a few that, that are still gonna present some next week at the Experimental Biology Conference. So we're very proud of them. And so I, I, I just welcome you and we'll get started in just a moment. I wanna introduce my co-host, Amy Bohan. Hey guys, I'm Amy Bohan. I'm a biology instructor as well as the honors director at South Florida State College. And a huge thank you not only to the students who are going to be presenting today, but also to their mentors. Um, their faculty mentors have done a lot of work to help get them to this point. And I'm a huge advocate of undergraduate research, both for the students that are in the honors program and for any student who's interested in getting into research. I think it helps them think kind of above and outside of the classroom and go beyond the classroom and they learn a skill set that I think really helps them in their time after SFSC. So I'm so proud of the students here. Some of them, like Dr. Hawker said, have already presented at conferences and some will actually be presenting next week at what's called the Experimental Biology Conference, which um, because of COVID is virtual, but we do have some students presenting there as well. And we've had multiple uh, students present at conferences this year. So I'm just really happy, really proud of the participation. And I'm also really excited that it's going kind of college wide. It's not just, you know, one specific discipline. It's you're going to see presentations from every discipline. And I'm just really proud of the students and the faculty mentors. All right. And I think we're ready. All right. So I would like to do, uh, introduce our first student speaker. Her name is Camilla Rimaldi Ibanez. She has worked with me in the past year and she's doing a, a really interesting project that I didn't know much about, but I said, I'll help you anyway. And it's called Ultrasonic Planimals Identifying Genes Associated with Coral Bioacoustics. Take it away, Camilla. Thank you, Dr. Hawker. Hello, everyone. My name is Camilla and my project has to do with corals. I'll just wait a little minute. Ah, oh, yay. Yay, there it is. <laughs> so there's the title again. Um, could you move on to the next slide, please? So as he mentioned, the my project is about corals. I'm very passionate about corals. I'm actually going to go major in marine biology. And I kind of started reading more about all the different problems corals are facing. And so I decided to do some kind of research to try to see if I could help them. And so I was kind of lost as to what I could do, but then I read an article that said that coral larvae are attracted to the sounds of coral reefs and can actually use the sounds of coral reefs as a guiding behavior to get to the coral reefs so that they can grow and develop there. And so that was really mind blowing. And I started doing some more research and it turns out there's a lot of different marine organisms that use sound and communication to thrive and grow. And so even in forests, <laughs> they're seeing that trees can communicate in several different ways and that this communication is critical for the livelihood of the entire forest. So my goal is to try to identify, can corals communicate? How can they do this? If they do, what are they communicating? And seeing if enhancing that communication can help restore and conserve our coral reefs that are in a lot that need help. So could you move on to the next slide? Oh, next one. <laughs> next one. <laughs> Sorry, this was for science there, so it's kind of long. So, oh, right there, you can see the different genes that I tested. So I did a whole background research and identified four genes that are related to sound emission or sound reception, and then analyzed to see if those genes were present in coral DNA. Next slide, please. So in order to do that, I first extracted, with the help of the awesome Dr. Hawker, um, <laughs> I, we um, extracted the DNA from coral fragments. And then I, we analyzed the DNA 
just to see is there a good concentration of DNA, of DNA to do PCR reactions. And so we selected a few DNA samples and then did the PCR reactions with the primer side developed for those genes that you saw in the other slide. And then we analyzed those uh, PCR results with an agarose gel, which you can see in the image here. So unfortunately, the first time that we did it, the results were pretty bad. <laughs> they came back as a lot of smearing, which is what you can see there. It looks like someone kind of painted across the gel. Um, and so that kind of just indicated nonspecific amplification. But then, next slide, um, we repeated the whole thing again with a few different changes, such as annealing temperature. We homogenized the coral samples before doing the DNA extraction and some other um, little conditions. And those seem to have a pretty big impact on the results. Yes, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so here you can see the, so as I said, we did verify the DNA before moving to the PCR reaction. So if we keep going on the slideshow, you'll see here is the agarose gels for the second time that we did it, the experiment. So when we got the good results for two of the genes that I tested, the TRPV gene, I don't know if I'm on my phone, so it might be bigger on your computer. But as you can see on samples 14, 16, 21, and 22, there's like little faint bands that are more concentrated than as like on the WACL2 gene, there's no concentrations anywhere. And that line that's on both of them is free nucleotides. So that doesn't really count. <laughs> Um, and then on the next slide, you'll see the same kind of thing for the fourth one, then the OTOP. You have the one OTOP, minute left. Okay, and the OTOP, not so good. And the fourth one, a few faint bands. So what those faint bands mean is that the genes are probably there. It's just that since the primers were developed from other organisms, they might not be the same length or might be a little bit different, but we do conclude that these genes are most likely present in the coral DNA. So that, that's all I've got to say, <laughs> if anyone okay. has any questions. We have about 30 seconds for questions, or we can wait till at 4.15, we'll have more time while we set up the next presenter. Okay. Also, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and you'll be able to ask Camila or any other presenter directly once they're done presenting. Okay, Amy. All right, well, we will go on to our next presenters. This is gonna be a group of three presenters, Joy Roth, Madison Diespies, and Kiriel Wickham. They're working with Dr. Kate Calvin. So take it away, guys. All right. Um, nice to have everyone here. I'm glad y'all can make it. So um, starting in the beginning of this year, I was able, um, Dr. Calvin reached out to me about her um, research project on the nitrate on um, determining the nitrate levels in our local lakes. And you know, when I first started, I, I really did not know much about this. My research ex experience was pretty limited and you know, I was kind of lost in some areas as much of this was pretty new. But um. So basically just to give a just of what we're doing. So Florida is home to, is the leader of one of the biggest leaders in citrus. And many of these plants require various fertilizers such as nitrate, phosphate, phosphorus, and various other nutrients. And during rainfall, all this runoff goes into our local reservoirs and lakes. This disrupts our lakes and reservoirs and pollutes everything around it. It also leads to algae blooms, such as the Okeechobee crisis going on currently, I believe. So what's the solution to this issue? The solution will be, um, is known as industrial hemp. This plant is, has been shown in studies to um, reduce radioactivity, reduce heavy metal levels, and reduce nutrients. nutrients. So um, yeah, so to, it removes nitrate, phosphorus, and other, nutrients in our lakes and reservoirs. 
So we we have a partnership with Hemp for Water and this company and college. We work we work with um a device called we work with a device called the Se segmented flow analyzer. And this um what this instrument does it it takes our samples, it runs it through a bunch of tubes, and usually once it comes in contact with these nutrients, um, it turns pink. So yeah. So it's the analyzer is a standard tool and it's used for environmental testing. And during our testing, um, we were able to establish, you know, so analyze standard solutions with the correlation coefficient of 0 0.999. Yeah, Dr. Calvin was really happy when she achieved this with when I achieved achieved this with her. And also our nitrate sample solution correlation coefficient was of 0 0.9995. So I'm pretty happy with those results. Okay, we can move on to um, uh, either Maddie or yeah or Kiara. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about our um, experimental strategy, materials, and methods. So we used something called a segmented flow analyzer, and it's used to measure the amounts of nitrate, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, in the plant and water samples that we've that we will be taking so um <laughs> if, so with the materials that we used all the chemicals were analytical grade and we purchased them from fisher science the uh we used 18 mega ohm filtered deionized water and we made sure all of our containers and utensils and stuff like that were rinsed out with an acid wash and then the, the 18 mega ohm filtered deionized water. And then the chemical waste was disposed properly. Um, so what we did was we took a sample of nitrate that we, act, well, we had to establish a baseline um, for the nitrate samples. So we mixed some nitrate up and then we ran the samples through a uh, one minute left. Oh, okay. And we ran it through this the segmented flow analyzer, and it pretty much changes the color from clear to pink. And then the segmented flow analyzer goes, Oh my goodness, look at that. Let me analyze how much that the uh, pink sample absorbed light. And then it gives a certain amount of wavelengths. And go ahead, Maddie, take it away from me. Dr. Callum, if you could quickly switch to the next slide. Um, I'm going to explain our results. So for our color test, as you can see in the little picture of the coil, super bright pink, which meant that the machine read our nitrate and the chemical reactions worked well. Then on the figures below, you can see the top one, it shows, this is a pond water, it shows um, the triplicate samples. We had nitrate in the first sample, but no nitrate in the second sample. And then on the picture below that, which was a few months later of pond water, we had no samples of nitrate found in our solutions. And then those are also our calibration curves. Um, for nitrogen, we haven't been successful with nitrogen yet. We have not been able to um, have it change color within the machine. We have within a vial, but we have to adjust our works. We're thinking the bleach is causing it to not change color. So hopefully we'll be able to work with the nitrogen and get that working soon. Okay, thank you both. Uh, you ran a little over, but that's okay because the next speaker is not here. So if anybody has questions for either uh, the first or second presenters, we have a couple minutes for you to do that. I've got a question. Go ahead, Keith. So um, are there any, I understand this is a kind of like a vacuum cleaner in a sense. <laughs> is, it, is, that, is that sort of the concept that it basically will take these unwanted elements that are there uh, that are present in our pond water, our lake water, and basically remove them. Um, as far as you know, are there any side effects, so to speak? I mean, uh, to, with this, um, this machine that you have uh, that's doing this? It's not, it's, not, it's not the machine that's doing it, it's the plants. So the, it's, it's hemp plants are doing it. And so the this here, this is the segmented flow analyzer that we are using to uh, measure levels in water, but also plant extracts. 
the thing that's pulling these nutrients out of the water is industrial hemp plant. And industrial hemp is a version of cannabis that does not have a lot of THC in it. So it's legal to grow as a crop plant. Okay, so it's an all natural solution to this problem, essentially. Yes. Hmm. Any other questions from anyone? Well, in the interest of, uh, I'm gonna go ahead, if, if, if Angelique Robertson is ready, I will introduce her next. Uh, Liam McBride is not going to be, is not presenting today. So uh, if Angelique's ready, I think she's got a video that she's gonna show and then she will answer some questions. Um, hers is on assessing biomarkers to predict colon cancer and colorectal cancer whenever uh, they get that video loaded. Colorectal cancer is the second most common cause of cancer death in the United States. Recent findings suggest that many colorectal cancers are likely to have spread long before the original tumor can be detected by current screening tests. A fundamental event in the spread of cancer cells and metastasis is epithelial mesenchymal transition, which is also known as EMT, of the cancer cells that enable the cells to detach and migrate. A surface protein expressed by epithelial cells, decadherin, plays a role in cell junctions and attachment and keeps the epithelial cells anchored. Bimentin is a cellular filament generally expressed by the mesenchymal cell as well as migrating cancer cells. This project analyzed the expression of biomarkers ecadian and bimentin to track the epithelial mesenchymal transition in colorectal cancer. He identified specimens of paraffin embedded tissue sections on slides from non cancerous, precancerous, and cancerous tissue samples taken as biopsies during colonoscopies for routine histopathological evaluation were analyzed for expression of EMT bio biomarkers, decadherin, and bimentin by immunofluorescence. We found that normal tissue specimens expressed decadherin in epithelial cells and bimentin in the stromal mesenchymal cells. Interestingly, some epithelial cells within the precancerous and cancerous specimens were found to express bimentin, suggesting initiation of EMT in these cells and their capacity to migrate. As seen here. The use of these biomarkers to supplement histopathological evaluation is promising and would provide more predictive and detailed analysis of cancer progression in tissue samples to aid in the choice of a, an appropriate treatment plan. The accurate pretreatment patient evaluation supplemented with such markers is pivotal to the modern push for personalized therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Angelique. Angelique, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great presentation, Angelique. So everyone, Angelique's available to answer questions if you have any about her presentation. I have really more of a, a comment than a question. Um, this is a very timely topic. I mean, especially with, they're finding out now that people uh, sometimes have a genetic predisposition to developing colorectal cancer you know, even before, I think it's, we used to be in the 50s, and they're finding, you know, finding uh, instances of this happening more frequently. So I just, I just wanted to throw that out there, that it's a very timely project that you're working on. Yes, it, it is. Um, we're actually working on, um, So, I'm sorry, can you guys hear me? My internet keeps going in and out. 
we can, we can okay. hear you. Okay, okay. Um, we're actually, we, we've been working on this. I've been working with Dr. Patel for since November on this project. Right, this is this is really timely and we all agree and we we have learned that from uh, you know some of the celebrity cases as well that it's uh, not only um, age related now but it's also you can see the racial disparities too so you're going to hear about that in a minute as well. Okay, well I have there, a oh. question. No, go go yeah. for it. I have a question. I have a quick question. Um, do you have any other, like, do you plan to continue this project? And if you do, are you, what kind of things do you want to find out? Like what, maybe what affects the, this receptor showing up or do you have any ideas for any of that? Um, I'll answer for that for her. Yes, we are going to continue this project. Yes, this is just the beginning right now. And, um, we have just looked at a couple of markers in a few samples, but we want to go into the details and look at the um, what we call as tumor micro environment. What are the changes that are happening and why are they happening and um, how can we catch them earlier? So we are going to be looking at many more markers. This is just the beginning. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Any any other questions from anyone? All right. Well, if not, I will go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Also with Dr. Mintu Patel is going to be Elizabeth Poe. I think you guys have the videos for that as well, or do we need to play that? They should have it. Right, okay, good. Is there supposed to be sound with this? There is, yes. right? Okay. Our last expand on our first presentations are briefly examining the demographics and disparities that we are seeing among patients being diagnosed with deadly form of cancer. I would also like to show how infant hearing can be used as a helpful tool. Colorectal cancer is the second most common type of cancer diagnosed in the United States. The American Cancer Society predicted that nearly 150,000 Americans would be diagnosed this year alone. About 1 in 23 men and about 1 in 25 women will suffer from colorectal cancer in their lifetime. That is more than 4% of the population. The demographics change an even bleaker picture for several minority racial groups. African Americans have the highest incidence of CRC in the United States. Jews of Eastern European descent have the highest prevalence in the world. Studies show that men have higher chance of developing and dying from CRC than women. The probability of developing colorectal cancer increases notably with age, with most cases occurring after age 50. The American population has changed dramatically over the last century. Over the last 10 years, the number of non-white, non-Hispanic, and the population has increased by more than 30%. This is an alarming fact when considering CRC because cancer rates and mortality rates are higher among the growing portion of the population. To compound the problem, this demographic has lower rates of cancer screening. A combination of research and expanded screening has helped the rate of CRC to drop among the general population. However, rates continue to climb among several racial groups. What can be done about this? There are several suggestions to be made. Education is vital, but educating the population, including minority groups, we can help spread understanding of this dreaded disease. Many patients are unaware of their family history, genetics, and lifestyle issues that lead to higher rates of CRC. Research must continue. 
Advancements in research with biomarkers have shown great potential for diagnosing and treating CRC before metastasizes. Early diagnosis is key to saving lives. Research makes this possible. Plus, we need funding. Budgetary allowances for education and research should help lower the incidence and mortality rates of colorectal cancers, especially minority racial groups. Let me share with you just one such finding that has helped doctors understand CRC. Researchers have made great strides by studying various biomarkers. We just saw a couple of biomarkers that Andrew Luke is studying, another one, NK hearing, is especially noteworthy. Studies have shown that the epithelial mesenchymal transition is a key molecular mechanism involved in the development of colorectal cancer. NK hearing is a mesenchymal marker of the EMC and has been closely linked to several cancers. Analysis indicated that incoherent expression was higher in tumor tissues than in adjacent normal tissue. Incoherent expression was associated with tumor differentiation, tumor size, as well as tumor nodes in metastasis stage. Incoherent carcinoma cells make up 95% of cholesterol cancer causes, and strides are being made in understanding how incoherent is expressed with adenocarcinoma. Analysis indicated that patients with high incoherent expression had significantly lower overall survival and disease free survival rates than those with low incoherent expression. Incoherent endowed tumor cells with enhanced migratory and invasive capacity, making metastasis a dangerous risk. Research suggests that incoherent has the potential of serving as a prognosis predictor and a promising therapeutic target for CRC. The more we know about CRC, the better we can fight it. Let us ensure that a person's demographic status does not prevent timely screening, early detection, and reliable treatment. This is all possible with greater education, research, and funding. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Are you here, Elizabeth, to answer questions? Yes, I am. Great. Anybody have questions for Elizabeth? I have one. So okay. First of all, I'm glad to be Hispanic <laughs> anyway, but unfortunately I had in my family a history of colorectal cancer. So um, genetics and my race will be a balance now. Uh, uh, my question is, is NK hearing is already being used as a marker or is it still in phase to try it and develop now XM for that? Um, I'll answer that for her. So no, it is not actually used um, in the normal histopathological evaluations, but these, all these markers that we just mentioned are the ones that we are trying to study. And there have been some studies where N-caterine is not supposed to be over here anyway, right? But when the cells are metastasizing, where the epithelial cells actually change their um, their their type and they become mesenchymal cells. Mesenchymal cells are the ones that can actually migrate from one place to the other place. Epithelial cells are going to stay put where they are. So as they are migrating, they, they start making all these other kind of proteins that help them migrate. And we have seen in other studies that n was uh, present in the esophageal cancers. So we thought, okay, let's let's go ahead and study this. And this was on my mind. And I told her, you go ahead and do your research and you come up with um, one of the markers. And there it was. She just came up with this, the same one that I was thinking about because we already did e urine. That we know that it is expressed by the epithelial cells, but we did not know that the n urine could be expressed when these cancer cells start moving away from the site of cancer for metastasis. So that is, it, it's going to lead to some quite interesting topics. That, that's really interesting. And if it is something more common to other types of cancer as well, why not try on the cell we have now Angela's work with as well? We work with thyroid cancer. That could be an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need to move on, but great questions and answers. Uh, we're gonna switch gears completely now. We're gonna have Jesse Fisher speak on a clean, well-lighted place. He's, uh, his mentor is Keith, Dr. Keith Cavito. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, briefly speak on a very short story. It's by Ernest Hemingway. Um, it is called A Clean, Well-Lighted Place. This is a story that I 
wrote a research paper on uh, or in 1102 in the summer uh, with Dr. Camino as my instructor. Um, Ernest, Hemingway, I mean, Ernest Hemingway did write this story and uh, was first published in 1933. It's literally a very short story, three pages. Um, there are three characters. There are a young waiter, an older waiter, and an old man. Um, and the story takes place in a cafe. Um, Hemingway really analyzes, in a sense, um, in the underlying theme, uh, loneliness and anxiety, and how three different uh, generations of these characters um, deal with these particular feelings. Um, what makes Hemingway and uh, and what distinguishes Hemingway from other authors is uh, clearly his, his writing style. Um, Hemingway uses a lot of dialogue um, as opposed to someone like Jack London uh, to build a fire where he could write an entire paragraph just on a tree in snow. Um, and all the dialogue really compels the, the reader and the audience to use your imagination. Uh, what does the cafe look like? Uh, what are the tables like? What is the lighting? That sort of thing. So it's very, very engaging. Um, this story in particular is unique because it begins um, in the narrative of the third person, and then it switches to the first person towards the end. Um, my final point about this story would be how the setting um, is very, very plausible, realistic, and relatable, which is also really nice. Um, the scenario of <clears throat> an old man um, in a bar with a younger waiter and an older waiter working is is the type of type of thing that maybe some of us um, would encounter at some point in time uh, during your life. If you went out to a restaurant, you could you could run into these sort of characters anywhere, literally. Uh, and I think that's a very attractive part of the story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. Does anybody have questions for him? Yes, yeah, I thought that was particularly good that you say your points without stopping and saying um and er and all of that between them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I, I enjoyed it too. Jesse, uh, quick, quick question. What do you think that story is saying about loneliness? Well, I mean, um, in particular, the older waiter could be uh, kind of construed as the, the main character because the younger waiter is very brief in the story in the beginning and then he goes home to his wife, the old man uh, kind of just shows up to the cafe to get drunk every night. And that's how he deals with his, his loneliness, his isolation. But the older waiter in particular um, sees himself potentially later in life um, as the old man. And when he goes home, it, um, he says, I guess it, and you kind of wonder what that is. It was nothing, but what is that? It, it could really be uh, insomnia. Um, it could really be his own personal fear of being alone, um, isolated, how he sees the old man in the story. Great, thank you. Okay, is there any, any other questions from anyone? Um, I have a question. So how do you think the end of that story relates to Hemingway as a person? Because um, Hemingway had an untimely death himself. And as the person says in the, the old waiter and the end of the story says, you know, um, that darkness, it, whatever it is, is creeping up on him. Yeah. Um, and very much like most uh, writers, you can, you can certainly identify um, them writing about themselves to an extent. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious that this cafe is in uh, early 20th century Spain because uh, they use Spanish language in the, in the short story. Um, and this could have easily came from Hemingway's experience. And yeah, Hemingway did have a bit of a, a, an issue with alcohol during his lifetime. So um, he certainly could have, could have identified with the old man, uh, that particular character later in life and saw himself uh, maybe headed in that direction. Uh, what I think is really interesting, though, is in Hemingway in particular, he is um, he's very, very progressive in a lot of the things that he writes, um, addressing something like anxiety and loneliness in 1933 in a short story was probably pretty uncommon, um, as well as Hills Like White Elephants, uh, which has its own underlying theme, which he wrote in 1927. So a lot of a lot of his writing and short stories are very uh, progressive in thinking, which I, I find very interesting as well. 
Thank you. Thank you. We need to move on. So go ahead, Amy. All right. So our next two students are actually two students who have been working with me for quite some time, Corrales Ewing and Carl Ewing, and they've been working on microRNA and canine congestive heart failure. So take it away, Carl and Kai. Okay. Um, we are going to use a, uh, the video re recorded for the Florida Academy of Sciences um, presentation and of course, that's for focusing in on sciences. So I'm imagining we may have some other things to say after that. Can you press play? Uh, no, I think there's a. Does we're, we're doing it, it'll play. Good. Yeah, it'll play. And then you'll you'll answer questions after, I believe. Okay, so I guess I'll mention too that we found that this sort of interview format. I don't know if I have this on your screen, but on the right side, we're kind of the the people on the zoom are kind of overlapping but use your imagination um we found that this interview format was kind of good because it, it gave um time for you know to get organized and think about the answer to the next question so just thought i'd mention that good afternoon my name is Corrales ewing uh, we're going to introduce our presentation to you this afternoon. I'm going to ask some questions of our lead investigator, Carl Ewing. Uh, Carl, um, we're looking at congestive heart failure. What is congestive heart failure? Congestive heart failure is a disease which results when the heart cannot move blood from the lungs back to the body efficiently enough to maintain life. Recent improvements in cardiac revascularization therapy repairing clogged arteries has reduced sudden death due to acute myocardial infarction heart attacks, but the number of individuals developing congestive heart failure has steadily increased. By the time diagnosis by outward symptoms is possible, approximately 50% of CHF patients die within five years of the diagnosis. Early detection of this disorder leading to CHF could slow the progression, but has been difficult to develop. All right. Um, uh, so you mentioned microRNA. What are microRNA? By influencing protein translation, microRNAs have emerged as powerful regulators of a wide range of biological processes. Recent studies have shown that microRNAs such as the ones tested in my study demonstrate promising tools to accomplish early detection of precursors of this disorder. All right. Um, well, um, why are microRNAs useful for early detection? Before the symptoms of CHF can be easily the heart's mitral valve becomes increasingly less efficient, putting an undetected strain on the heart. Other than the heart valve replacement, which involves a very invasive operation, there is no way to reverse mitral valve prolapse, known as myoxymatous mitral valve degeneration in dogs. Slowing down the worsening of the condition before the congestive heart failure occurs is a preferred treatment. And microRNA are proving to be useful biomarkers to accomplish this. With simple blood tests, the health of the heart's mitral valve can be monitored by, for stress by evaluating levels of certain microRNAs. So, oh. Um, we also uh, talk about exosomes in our study. Um, what are exosomes and what do they have to do with microRNAs? Exosomes are small vesicles that contain some microRNA. It is believed that they better protect microRNA as they move through the circulatory system from one part of the body to another. It is not surprising that the heart experiencing stress causes other organs to work less efficiently. 
Exosomes are suspected to be the body's method of communicating this stress in an attempt to maintain homeostasis. Uh, and uh, what is cardiorenal syndrome? We're looking at that. So what is that? Cardiorenal syndrome is an umbrella term used in the medical field that defines disorders of the heart and kidneys, whereby acute or chronic dysfunction in one organ may induce acute or chronic dysfunction in the other. The crosstalk between the heart and the kidney is clearly evidenced but not fully understood. These two systems are highly dependent on one another. The heart distributes nutrients and oxygen to the kidney, while the kidney is the major organ responsible for regulating salt and water balance of the whole body. We are interested in investigating this association by comparing CHF to CRS and how communication between them by exosomes may play a part. All right, this is very interesting. Hopefully everyone will want to see the rest of our presentation from this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl and Kai. Do anyone, uh, does anyone have any questions for Carl and Kai and their research on heart failure? Okay. I have a quick kind of question slash, I don't know. But you've mentioned about like the relationship between the heart and the kidney. Do you think it might be because they both have a function in like cleansing the body? You know, like the heart um, works with oxygenizing the blood and then the kidneys with just cleaning out some toxins. So maybe since they both have that function, they have similar receptors or something that help do that. Um, I guess I'll answer that one. Um uh, in a story, yes. Um, the heart, the, the obviously the kidneys and all the major organs depend a lot on the heart for nutrients and oxygen, and the kidneys in particular, um, regulating the salt to water balance, affect the heart much more closely than other organs. So in either one, when either one of those starts not working as efficiently as it should. It affects the other, and there's kind of a feedback loop. Each one makes the next one worse. Each one makes the next one worse. And um, what we didn't really mention in that, that since that video was kind of an intro, is um, the usual therapy or treatment for um, uh, heart congestive heart failure or pre, which is um, mitral valve prolapse, is to give a person. Um, drugs to reduce their blood pressure because a lot of the thing with the valve not matching up for which it's letting blood back up through back into the lungs is due to inflammation and there so there's an inflammation connection between the two when the um, kidney system when the renal system is not working right and there's inflammation it ends up not filtering properly and the problem has been if you give some, if somebody has cardiorenal syndrome, which has both of those malfunctioning, um, if you give them uh, med medications to reduce their blood pressure, which makes it easier for the heart to work, it also it, it helps the kidneys to some extent as far as the inflammation, but it also, after a certain point, can inhibit the kidneys' action because the kidney has to have a certain amount of pressure to push. Um, the push the uh, blood through and filter off the waste material, the glomerular filtration rate. So the, I guess what I'm getting or trying to get answer the question is the, um, this uh, finding is very preliminary finding that we kind of based our thing on here was that there's a particular microRNA that is found to be much more common in animals and people with this type of condition than would normally be. And part of what they did, which we can't do, we're going to, we're hoping to next do a sort of scaled down version of is they took actual, they had uh, mice and they were able to induce the problem and then try giving them an antagamy or something that blocks the action of the myr 21 to stop the inflammation. And it helped in both. 
So it was it, it's looking like it might be a solution to whatever they give a person for the heart uh, slows down the efficiency of the kidney and vice versa. This might be one that actually helps in both. So what we're hoping to do is um, uh, next term um, start uh, culturing cells and, and induce um, the same kind of um, enzyme problems that that uh, encourage the my, my R21 star to get going and then try introducing antagomeres, which is the blocker of the my R21 star, because that way we'll know from the other direction, you know, is this a, a, an interesting coincidence or is it, or which came first even, is the my R21 star influencing the heart and kidney or is the heart and kidney you know, causing more my R21 star to be Produced. Don't really can't really tell that yet. So that's what we're working on next. Hopefully. All right. So we need to move on. Kai, thank you for your answer. And uh, next is Sandra Contreras, Gabriel Desio, and Brandy Ellerby uh, with Dr. Kate Calvin, and they have their talk next. And they're doing it live, I believe. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm Gabriel and I'm gonna uh, go ahead and do this presentation along with my um, partner, Sandra. Brandy is here, but she's not able to talk uh, right now. So I'm just gonna quickly introduce our topic. Um, we are studying a China native plant um, with a relative in Florida uh, that the Buck Tower Gardens actually provided for us to study. Uh, this plant is actually um, going extinct, which is the reason why we're studying it. And in China, it's so popular that people just use it um, for any, honestly, but it's got so many medicinal properties that people drink it in tea. Um, you know, it's a berry, so people eat it. They just incorporate it in their day-to-day -day diet. Um, okay, so the way that we studied the phytochemicals in the plant, we actually had several um, trials when it comes to the sample prep. Um, it was very challenging to actually got to a powder state uh, because we actually had um, a container full of the berries with um, water that was previously frozen. So it took us a little bit to melt the berries um, and actually process them. So the way that we did, uh, did that the first time was using liquid nitrogen. So we were trying to uh, flash freeze the sample uh, in order to pulverize it and be able to extract it. That was a little bit messy and we actually don't have pictures of that in our slides, um, but it came to a buttery um, type of texture when it was introduced to our solvent, uh, which at first we used three different solvents uh, with different polarities. So the one shown on here is isoamyl alcohol, which is a polar solvent. The second time, um, or the second uh, version of the sample prep that we used uh, was drying the actual berries. So we took the berries um, and we, after introducing it to the solvent, we let it sit for five days and then we dried it in um, the oven in the laboratory. Um, it's worth to mention that we let it dry for over two days and the temperature was slightly above room temperature. And we did this in hopes um, of avoiding any um, degradation. Um, Sandra, do you have anything to add to, to that? Uh, yes, actually, the powder form made it easier to actually get results. Uh, the buttery form, I, I don't even think we got much out of it. So powder was the way to go. And it was even easier to grind because when we were trying to do the fl flash freeze, it it kept melting on us. We, we were really kind of getting um, discouraged at that point. But other than that, I, I'd say the powder, like the slow dried was better. So it took some time, but we got results. Yeah, I would definitely say the goal was to get it to dissolve in the solvent as much as we could. And that was definitely the best um, uh, the, the best uh, version that we obtained at the end. Um, let's see. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Or the previous? Yeah, the next one. Okay. So um, this 
is our calibration curve, uh, which we used a series of dilutions to make uh, with cholesterol and isoamyl alcohol. Um, as you guys can see, um, we got an R squared value of 0 0.99, which is acceptable. And we were actually very happy to be able to accomplish that. Um, that basically goes to show that the machine was calibrated correctly, that the machine was reading well um, in isoamyl alcohol, which was the um, solvent that we used um, when analyzing and introducing our sample to the GCMS machine. Um, so a little backtrack, um, we used uh, ga gas chromatography and mass uh, spectroscopy in our experiment um, in order to analyze our sample. Um, and the way that we did that, if we could just go back to the previous slide for a second. Um, if you guys can see in the middle of the slide, there's a picture of the GCMS machine. Um, and the way that it works is once the sample is injected, the carrier gas tank, um, it's a helium tank. And it basically carries the, the, the compound up uh, into the gas, into the coal column. As you can see, it's coiled right there. And then the rising temperatures actually elude the compound up there, which will then come down and be fragmented into ions um, in the mass spectrometry. So basically, um, that will give us a um, mass to charge ratio, and that's the way that the computer will read it and the way that we're able to identify the compounds. Um, we also have a library that has, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands or millions even of compounds um, that we use to search, um, you know, for the properties and the names of each compound which allowed us to actually come up with a nice table with the phytochemicals and the biological molecules that have the medicinal values. Um, so we were trying to see if we could find some molecules um, and different compounds um, that kind of match the medicinal values of the one of the, of the plant in China. So if we could just move on to the table. Yes, so as you guys can see here, we just um, took uh, some of the most relevant um, uh, bio biological molecules that we found with high scores. Anything above 700 is acceptable. And as you all uh, can see, pretty much everything has a search index of well above 700, um, meaning that the machine um, is telling us that the the chances or the probabilities that this specific compound is unique is very high. Um, we divided um, our molecules into sterols, fatty acids, terpenes, metabolites, and alkaloids, um, all of which are different kinds of biological molecules with different kinds of um, human applications and even plant applications. One minute left. Okay, Sandra, do you have anything to add to the table? So we were able to identify our prominent 17 um, compounds and out of those 17, 12 of them are known beneficial to our like human application. So meaning that some of them are like our metabolites or they're even uh, medicinal. So some of them uh, are known to like be uh, used for screen, um, sunscreen or some are anti-inflammatories. Uh, some of them, uh, I believe, can like lower cholesterol levels. So it's just something to keep in mind when we're trying to research new like medicinal <laughs> alternatives. Okay, thank okay. you. Any any questions before we move on for, for these for these guys? I I would like to say something about this. So a few years back when um, we were doing DNA barcoding, this was one of the plant. Again, we got it from the, um, from Bok Tower as well. And uh, since this is a rare species, species, we were doing DNA barcoding of this. And it came out to be the new name for this plant is now Pseudo Zizifus salata. And um, its closest cousin was supposed to be in California because we had an ice bridge connection. But after that, after we did the DNA barcoding, we actually studied the antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, and anti-cancer properties of the leaves. So we made alcohol extract and um, water extract. And uh, this plant, I believe, you know, there were a few, few plants that we studied. 
And I, off the top of my head, I do not remember, but this plant did have some of the properties. So I was really glad to see your presentation and you saw all these things. We just looked at the properties, like, you know, we took the cultured the cells and put these uh, in different doses in there the extract and we saw the effect and now you have seen the, the compounds in there so this is a really good study and i'm really glad you did this thank you sir uh, so, thank you so much for saying that and just to quickly touch back if we can just move on to the next slide um we would just like to thank the bug tower gardens for providing us with this plant and we'd also like to mention uh, thank you dr patel um we were unable to study um the leaves or the bark or the root of the plant actually are all our data came from the berry. Uh, but in the future, we are interested in continuing to um, study other parts of the plant that definitely will have um, more medicinal value. Great job. Any questions for him before we move on? I have a quick question. Um, do you know how the berry or the one that's similar, like in China, how it's used? Because I like we eat very healthy, and we I know that a lot of Chinese medicine they take extracts or things like that from mm -hmm. different plants. So yes. maybe if you see how the Chinese use it, you can try to even see how you could use the like mm -hmm. potent size those compounds that you found to benefit humans from all those amazing compounds that you found, yeah. that's really cool. Definitely, um, people in China mostly drink it as tea. So yeah, definitely um, sort of an infusion as you were saying, um, that's the most widely used form of it um, as far as I read. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on, uh, we're going to have Aaliyah Walker with Miss Carla Respress present a pupil's gaze. Oh, hey, hello. Um, so for my series this year, I did um, a series on the lover's eye jewelry. And I was really inspired to do it after reading an article about it because I had never heard about it before. And I thought it was really neat. So um, if we could move on to the next slide. Um, just a brief history of it. Um, Prince George of Wales, the son of King George III, in simpler terms, he was a bit of a player. And um, he was known for being a ladies man. Um, if we can move to the next slide. He had a companion um, named Maria Ann Fitzherbert and she was Catholic. So because of the Church of England, that laws forbade them from being together because she was not allowed to become a monarch. But Prince George decided to propose anyways. And since he did that, she fled the country to avoid a controversy. And um, in response, Prince George sent her a letter proposing again. And in the letter, he said, I send you a parcel and I send you at the same time an eye and he had sent her a necklace with his eye painted on it. And it was kind of bizarre because um, it's just this striking eye just staring back at you and people would keep it near their heart or on their wrist. And um, I provided some um, examples as well, if we can move to the next slide. So this is what the eyes would look like. They could be rings, brooches, necklaces, pins, and um, I was really inspired by these in particular because I loved the pearls on them. And um, I have some more examples on the next slide. And um, in the back of them, they would sometimes put locks of hair. Um, it was really a way for them to carry their significant other with them. So um, if we could close the PowerPoint. Um, I created eyeballs <laughs> um, based on the lover's eye. And um, I interviewed some couples and um, I kind of wanted to, uh, in these questions, kind of figure out what it is, like what it, love is to other people, like to drive them to even wear an eye on their chest of their significant other. So this is an example. Um, this one's titled Gloria. So this was actually based off of her eye color and in the inside based on the questions I created, um, just like a little scene in the back. So 
Hers has clouds to um, show how she would see her boyfriend, Andrew. And then I asked Andrew the same questions. So this would be his eye. And then on the back, this is how he sees Gloria. And then this one is Caleb. <laughs> and um, it's a lily pad, it's kind of hard to see, but. And then this one is Haley. And how she sees Caleb would be in the back. And the questions I asked were, um, what emotions do you feel when you think about that person? Um, if you were to think of them as an inanimate object, what would it be? Um, what colors do you associate with them? How would you describe them? And how do you see, what do you see when you look at them? So based on those questions um, and the answers they gave me, I told them they could write whatever they wanted. I interpreted that and put them on the eye. <laughs> Thank you, Elias. That was wonderful. Does anybody have any questions for her? I thought that was excellent uh, presentation. And I suppose it's much better to have an art form rather than someone like, you know, maybe a Van Gogh or <laughs> chopping off the ear <laughs> and sending it literally to your, you know, to someone, his brother in this case, or the prostitute, I think it was. But anyway, excellent, excellent uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. Any uh, any other questions for Aaliyah? I, I agree with Dr. Cavito. I thought that was excellent. I'm curious, is there any significance to the eye being at an angle? As if, because uh, I, I noticed in both of the pictures of the eye, it's almost as if it's looking at you from the corner instead of like directly head on. Is, is that like an artistic aesthetic at the time period or? Um, for like regarding the examples I showed? Yes. Um. Usually, um, from what I researched, it was just um, about like this. They only incorporated like a little bit of the eyebrow. Sometimes you could see some of the hair. And I think it really um, depended on the emotions they wanted to convey. So some were more filled with like a lustful look or it's just depending on the gaze, I guess, that they wanted to convey. Because a lot of the time, whenever they would give these eyes, from what I read, um, the relationship wasn't exactly accepted by society back then. So it was just kind of something secretive for them. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Aaliyah. We're gonna move on to our next presentation, which is Angela Huang. Uh, her her uh, mentor is Dr. Daniel Sanchez, and she's gonna do, I'll let her give the title, okay? Take it away, Angela. Hi, um, I think that my presentation was um, a video. Right, it should be a video for her. So a lot of research suggests a relationship between the circadian clock and cancer, and a key example of this would be the inhibitive relationship between PER2, which is um, a part of the circadian clock, and P53, which is the key gene that's involved in cancer. Not only this, the circadian clock has also been shown to have impacts on cells metabolism. And interestingly enough, um, a gene that links all three of these processes on um, metabolism oncogenesis and the circadian clock is P53, which you can see in figure one. Mm. The impacts of the circadian clock on cancer can be seen through one of its key hormones, melatonin. And in figure two, we can see that melatonin actually has an inhibitive effect on the majority of the cancer hallmarks. So in this project, um, what we want to assess is the effects of melatonin on two of these hallmarks, um, cell metabolism and apoptosis in thyroid cancer cells. And so the first step would be to expose the cancer cells to melatonin and then culture them. Um, then after culturing, we'll see the survival of the cells using a live dead assay. Um, then in order to attribute any of the cell 
depths to apoptosis, we can use a tunal assay. Then to attribute the apoptosis to mutated p53, we can use a Western blot. And then finally, um, to see any changes in the cell's metabolism, we can use an NAD plus NADH ratio assay. And the results of this experiment will hopefully help us further comprehend the anti-cancer effects of melatonin and the circadian clock, as well as seeing potential treatments for cancer. Thank, thank you, Angela. I actually have a question for you, Angela, or maybe a comment for you and Dr. Sanchez. You know what you could do. You have human umbilical vein endothelial cells. We could do a tube assay on matrogel. You could test melatonin on it to see if it blocks tube formation. That would be an experiment you and Dan, Dr. Sanchez could do. Just a suggestion. That is nice. <laughs> it sounds interesting, yeah. Any other questions for Angela? Uh, all right. Well, if not, sorry, uh, I had to go. My name is Osvaldo. Oh, oh, go for it, Osvaldo. Uh, that was my video right there that they played a little bit. I'll go ahead and let them put it up. Okay, so next up is Osvaldo Cisneros and Nancy Morrissey. They are working with both. Uh, Doctors Mintu Patel and Dr. Hawker. Hello, my name is Osvaldo Ceros, and I am the author of this presentation. This is the poster and overview of what I'll be discussing among these slides, breaking down the poster into sections for an easier understanding of what our research is about. Angiogenesis is a vital function that enables growth and development, such as healing from wounds. This process allows formation of new blood vessels to form, allowing oxygen and nutrients to be delivered to vital parts of our body and tissue. The image is showing the structure and lining of the artery wall. The inside of the blood vessels is lined by a single layer of endothelial cells called endothelium. And these endothelial cells migrate and initiate formation of new blood vessels. Understanding the intricacies of this process allows us to understand angiogenesis. Endothelial cells initiate the process of angiogenesis in response to several factors, including the TGF-beta growth factors. Binding the TGF-beta receptors on the endothelial cells results in a signaling cascade leading to regulation of gene transcription. There are many different kinds of TGF-beta ligands that can bind to many different kinds of TGF-beta receptors resulting in many different kinds of effects. In this project, we are trying to understand which CGF beta receptors are being expressed in the endothelial cells. Here's the overview of our procedures. First, we use human endothelial cells that were cultured, then the RNA were isolated, allowing cDNA to be synthesized from the RNA. Using the RT-PCR, we are able to detect the gene expression. The results are analyzed using the BioRab Mastro software for the gene expression. The receptors that are being studied in the RNA are among the following, ACVIL-1, endoglin, and TGF-beta receptor-1. GAP-DH is being used as a housekeeping gene, meaning that the target receptors will be compared to gap DH since it is always present in the cell. This graph reveals that ACVIL-1, endoglin, and TGF-beta receptor-1 expressions compared to the housekeeping gene gap dh ACVIL-1, endoglin, and TGF-beta receptor-1 were all expressed in the endothelial cells. Now that we know that these three TGF beta receptors are all expressed by the endothelial cells, our future studies will focus on what other types of receptors were being expressed by these cells and which TGF beta ligands bind and cause a signal in the endothelial cells. I just wanted to show uh, these are some recent events where in meetings where I was given an opportunity to present my research with the aid and help of Dr. Patel. We both discussed the idea and um, we were able to bring this project into motion, fully initiating the project for the Florida Undergraduate Research Conference and Florida Academy of Science, where I was able to receive second place for our research. And Dr. Hawker will present this research and results at the experimental biology coming very soon. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Great job, Osvaldo. Any questions for Osvaldo? from the audience.
Also, I just want to say congratulations. That's huge, Osvaldo. There was, I just want to brag a little bit more. There was only at the Thanks. FAS Thanks. conference, there was like, um, it was mostly universities presenting. There's only like three or four um, uh, state colleges that were presenting science research. And he won second place out of all the undergraduates from universities and colleges. So I think that's an outstanding job, Osvaldo, outstanding. Congratulations, Osvaldo. What, what got you interested in this topic in the first place? For uh, the honor stuff. And I went to Dr. Patel to, um, you know, find these hours and stuff. And she actually brought up the idea, like I said in the video. And so I just went with her and it was actually, like, I got to know more stuff about the endothelial cells and like, how it was related to these can't like the cancer, how angiogenesis and all that stuff happened. Like, I'm pretty sure I'll probably be coming back for summer to like continue this work and stuff with her. Right. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm next. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm next. Going to switch gears again. We're going to introduce Colby Bowers. This is Dr. Hello. Doctor. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead, Colby. All right, so um, may I share my own screen for this? Um, there we go. Thank you. So my um, project was on the Harlem Renaissance and the American identity, um, African-American identity. And we'll go through the, the poster later, but I just want to make, go through the main points right now. So what you're going to see in the first Orleanian um, jazz stars, um, the lifestyle that they led was very um, like party wise and they were, they got drunk every night and stuff like that playing on like with their jazz. Um, what you're going to, what you're going to see is, um, uh, Buddy Bolden, um, he actually died of alcoholism and insanity because he just got in so insecure that others would steal his style. And what you're going to see with the next um, Orleanian king, jazz king, was um, Freddie Keppard. He actually distrusted record companies and never recorded with them. So you're going to see where he did not um, ever record a record because he thought people would steal his stuff. And moving on, you're going to go into where um, the Great Migration is actually going to cause uh, millions of African Americans to flood into um, urban spots such as Harlem, which became a cultural epicenter because it was the home of the NAACP and the Cotton Club, which was a club that um, routinely jazz stars played at. Um, what you're going to see is the differing ideologies of Du Bois and Alan Locke, which um, very, very, very... Um, um, I would say motivated um, African American artists to um, be more sophisticated than their predecessors. You're going to see um, black nationalism take place, which is an idea of Du Bois, um, where their achievements are more so pushing a new black culture separated from um, the old one of um, um, just slavery and Jim Crow laws. And then you're going to see actually from this um, Louis Armstrong and Ethel Waters, that an artist like this breaking the mainstream um, and a changing of the audience from, say, uh, black to white and um, more of these um, race records popping up like Black Swan Records and OK Records. Black Swan Records was actually the first fully black record um, label established. Um, and then the, my conclusion in coming to this was um, something actually Du Bois came up with was the double consciousness. And um, the double consciousness goes as follows, like um, the, while the black artist was um, focused on um, getting financial power and money, they were always focused on their image and what they put out there as a black artist, say like, they were conscious about social issues at the time. Um, the Harlem Renaissance accomplished um, putting um, black voices out there as um, the, um, ex or excuse me, the Harlem Renaissance um, went through many things, but
but um, what you're going to see is the Harlem Renaissance very much established an identity for these African Americans. And now that I'm at my poster, I would like to open up for any questions for the rest of the time. Does, does this have any parallels your topic with uh, a blues music? Because uh, that's, a, that's a genre of music I'm particularly interested in. And I'm talking about going back to the 1920s, early 1930s, uh, Charlie Parker, Robert Johnson. These were, you know, these were uh, very talented African-American and original blues singers. Uh, but uh, you know, of course, they were, when they recorded their music, uh, it was for predominantly white, you know, uh, companies, you know, companies that were selling their music to white people. Yes. And I was just wondering if there was any maybe overlap between you know that particular genre of music and then your your topic here. Well, my my project focused mostly on jazz, but we what you're going to see is that um, blues and especially the early 1900s, um, very much influenced Orleanian jazz and Dixieland jazz. And you're going to see where the somber playing of these blues players had dripped into maybe some of the um, rawness of these jazz players and how they played. OK, thanks. Of course. Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good job. Great, job. Great job, Colby. And we're going to move on to Devin Patel. He is working with Dr. Mintu Patel. The role of sugar in cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death globally. It is caused due to the narrowing of arteries and begins with endothelial dysfunction. The endothelium, as shown, is a one cell layer thick layer that lines the artery. When this begins to uh, function incorrectly, this can lead to a buildup of plaque which leads to cardiovascular disease. Sugar is overabundant in our diet and may have a role in cardiovascular disease. But can sugar actually cause cardiovascular disease? Yes, one way sugar can is that it causes the inflammation of endothelial cells, which leads to endothelial dysfunction and eventually leads to cardiovascular disease. Some of the markers used were IL-6 or interleukin-6, a cytokine that can be used to detect inflammation, nitric oxide, which endothelial cells use to maintain vascular tone, and endoglin, which is a receptor involved in the production of nitric oxide. Human umbilical vein endothelial cells, or HUVEC cells, were treated with glucose and fructose, and then the inflammation markers were analyzed by ELISA assay. In the cells treated with glucose and fructose, the IL level six were higher, the total nitrate levels were lower, and the endoglin levels were lower. In conclusion, the data suggests that endothelial cells show inflammatory changes in response to sugar. Overabundant dietary sugar may be one of the causes for cardiovascular disease that is prevalent in our society. This is preventable by making simple dietary changes. The multi-pronged approach to lifestyle changes show that individual awareness, community campaigns, government policies and regulation can all three lead to healthy citizens. Okay. okay, great. Uh, Dr. Patel is here. If, if anybody has any questions about Devon's presentation. I was wondering, what, what are you envisioning for those government policies and regulations on that last slide? 
Yes. So, you know, like in many places, they have these um, regulations on the um, on the food, food items, like, you know, you, you have to have under certain amount of sugar present in say um, cereal. So if you look at the European countries, they have a lot of regulations in place over there. A um, lot of places have soda taxes so that soda is not really available, um, you know, to people because you're taxing now you don't have, um, it is available, but we can control a little bit in that way. So a lot of government policies have to be in place to um, help us. Right now, you know, what happens is we, we uh, when we're looking for fast food, whatever is available is not really healthy at that point. But if government policies come through and say that these are the things that we need to put in place where people can reach out and eat, then those are the things that we can actually make the changes at. Individuals can also make those changes, but if we are surrounded by good food, then we will have those choices to make. Any other questions? What kind of sugar did he, did you all work with? Did you try different types of sugars? Uh, no, he only did the um, glucose and fructose because our table sugar that is normally present is either, um, you know, sucrose, that is glucose and combination of glucose and fructose, or uh, some of the food items that we have has the high, high, um, and the high fructose corn syrup. So that is fructose again. So he was looking at um, glucose and fructose and effect of like either or because we know that glucose is generally, we need glucose in our diet so that we can uh, obtain energy from, but the fructose that tags along in the sugar is we don't really need that that much. We get it in, uh, in fruits in a little bit of amount and that's just good for us. Um, when we have a lot of fructose, that it can be more metabolized in a different way than glucose is in our body. And that may be leading to some of the problems. I think it would be cool to kind of see, have research evidence showing maybe the effects of how different sugars work in endothelial cells, just so maybe you could have research supporting policy changes, you know? Right. And there are actually a lot of um, um, studies that are being done on that as well. So it, ours wasn't the first one. There are many other studies that, that show, make that connection between the, the glucose and fr fructose and especially higher level. Like in blood, you, you have to have certain level, otherwise you're going to be hypoglycemic. But when you start eating, you know, sugar laden food, which is um, when you have a, a sugar spike in your blood, at that point, you are having um, a higher concentration of um, glucose and even fructose at that point. So that, that's when you're going to see the changes in the endothelium and endothelium, like how we were discussing in the cancer cells, they are tightly packed, but when they are not functioning well, they become loosely packed and they allow things to go through. And that's how um, we start seeing the plaques build up as well. Okay, thanks. I have a comment. Sure. It's more of a comment or question, but uh, certainly there'll be a lot of, there's, there are a lot of efforts that will be needed to re-educate physicians and nutritionists. Um, there's many decades of misinformation with uh, high fat diets and I mean, it, Absolutely. it was common knowledge, I think, amongst nurses that you cut sugar, your triglyceride levels plummet almost immediately. So um, what, what efforts could be made to re-educate uh, physicians and uh, healthcare practitioners. Um, Re-educate them. I mean, you know, these studies have been published, and um, recently, uh, just a few years back, uh, there was a whole report that came out, and that created a little bit of, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of noise in our community as well because. Initially, when people were studying, like, you know, 40, 50 years ago, they were studying about the effect of sugar um, on the um, cardiovascular disease. People were saying that sugar was not the culprit, the fat was the culprit. And then we all went on that diet of low fat diet and all those things that came about after that. But at that point, there were some studies that were 
pointing to sugar as well. And because those were actually funded by the sugar industry, they were kind of put in the back burner. And the whole thing came about a few years back, um, you know, and then they said that sugar is the one, not only is it implicated in cardiovascular disease, it's implicated in, in, um, in many other diseases. We, we call it as metabolic syndrome, where many things are affected in our body, not just the heart, but a lot of other things are impacted. And also, um, it causes cancer, too. It causes addiction, too. So a lot of things are um, connected to sugar. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's not my project and we're probably going over time, but I just recommend for like everyone, just whenever you're at the store and you're about to buy something, just take, check the nutrition label because there's sugar in places you never thought there would be sugar. Exactly. There is sugar. There's 10 times more sugar than you would expect. So when you see that, you can double check to see, do I really want this? Or maybe next time. <laughs> Absolutely. Ketchup. And you know, like you're eating salad and you think it's really good. And let me drizzle some of those, um, you know, condiments on them and they are full of sugar as well. So you're right. Okay, great. So we're going to move on to the next presenter, which is Maria Flores Loya working with Dr. Kate Calvin on drug design for Tay-Sachs disease. I think she's got a video. So she's doing it live. Is that right? You're doing it live, Maria? Um, I actually pre-recorded my presentation. Okay. Does, does, does Tasha have it? Do you have it, Tasha? Yes. Christian's going to play it. Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Flores, and today I will be presenting my final project for Organic Chemistry to Honors. Professor Kali and I work very closely with the purpose of designing a drug that could potentially be used to treat patients with Tay-Sachs. Tay-Sachs is a lysosomal storage disease characterized by the accumulation of GM2 gangliosides due to a faulty gene on chromosome 15 that reduces the activity of the enzyme hexosamine base, also known as hexase. Without this enzyme, GM2 gangliosides accumulate in lysosomes, damaging the brain and spinal cord. Past studies in which TASEX patients were administered doses of pyrimethamine, a folding chaperone, showed an increased amount of XA activity. However, the prolonged use of pyrimethamine eventually inhibited its activity. We hypothesized that this chaperone bound XA too well in conditions where the ligand reached higher levels. Therefore, our goal was to design a pyrimethamine analog that would bind XA less tightly than original pyrimethamine and also with less affinity than the natural target GM2 gangliosides. We began by altering the structure of the GM2 gangliosides, and we were able to acquire different docking simulations with a binding range of negative 5.6 and negative 5.1, whereas pyrimethamine had a binding range of negative 5.2 to negative 4.9. Then, we designed the analogs by modifying their structure until we obtained a few with an affinity score lower than negative 5.2. We were able to obtain two pyrimethamine analogs, analog one with a score of negative 5.1 and analog zero with a score of negative 5.0. It was accomplished using computational resources, including PyMol and MQL. Then we proceeded to compare them to one another. XA formed five hydrogen bonds with itself and three hydrogen bonds with analog one, while hexa formed one hydrogen bond with analog zero and three with itself. Both formed two types of hydrophobic interactions, including a cation pi and a T-shaped interaction. Our results were very similar to the ones obtained in James et al such as the binding interactions between hexa and GM2 gangliosides. In these images, we can see protein substrate and protein-protein interactions, as well as the common amino acids that were bound to both analogs. After examining our data, we have no reason to disbelieve the behavior depicted by the ligand. We can say that both ligands are possible candidates based on the interactions we observed. More research is needed in order to determine which analog could have a better effect on Tay-Sachs patients. Our research was limited to using software programs. However, 
Our data is promising and could lead to potential discoveries in the treatment of TSACs if more testing is made. And the next slide is a list of our references. Thank you. Okay, anybody have any questions for Maria? I'm right. curious, uh, I'm sorry, I got a question. I'm curious as to why TASACs, what, uh, what started your interest in that particular disease? Um, I just thought it was really interesting seeing all the symptoms and how, uh, well, it's a very deadly disease. And I was really interested in the, just the pathway and how um, the lysosomal storage diseases, how they can be um, such a little, any, um, how do you say it? Not mutation, but dysfunction can cause such great impact. Any other questions? All right. In the interest of time, uh, we're going to move along to Allison Smith, and she is working with Jake Fitzgerald. OK, so before he pulls my thing up, my name's again Allie, and I picked this topic because I hope to go into sports medicine and eventually work with a college sports team, hopefully. So this is kind of where I got my idea from. Okay, so my topic is platelet-rich plasma therapy and unutilized option for healing collegiate athletes. Next slide, please. So platelet plasma is a form of regenerative medicine, which means that the treatment comes from the patient themselves. The patient gives blood and then it is contrib... Contri uh, I can't say it. It's basically separated from the red blood cells and the plasma, and then the plasma is isolated into a form where it is injected back into the patient and it pretty much speeds up the healing process. So it's very interesting in the way that once you isolate something from the body, it can help the body speed itself up. Next slide, please. How is it currently being used? Platelet plasma is currently being used on the age range 45 and older, just because once humans generally hit that age, um, their body needs more help in healing themselves. That's why there's always older patients coming into the office to get this treatment, especially at a local place called Florida Joint and Spine, where this medicine is actually used here in Huntington County. The patients get injections into their back because they have a lot of pain with walking, and this helps them speed up their healing process and also gives them pain-free solutions. So, but it's generally used to heal ligaments, tendons, and sometimes joints. And it's interesting that it's not used at the collegiate level right now because of all the benefits of speeding up the natural healing process. It is used in major league sports like soccer, the NBA, NFL, and they're competing at a higher level. So why isn't it used at the collegiate level? Next slide. Um, so now, should it be used? Uh, platelet plasma is proven to be safe for any age group. It generally isn't used on ages 10 and younger just because they're so young and they heal pretty fast on their own anyways. But it's kind of confusing to why there's this gap between high school athletes and professional and they're just not using it at that age group. So collegiate low athletes are a next level sporting competition. So shouldn't they be allowed to have the next level of treatment just as a professional athlete? Instead of earning their paycheck, they're earning their tuition. So shouldn't they be given the option? Um, and platelet plasma is not seen as a booster for abilities according to NCAA guidelines. It's not seen as a steroid or anything that could benefit the athlete and their abilities. So it is safe in that way. Next slide, please. I definitely like to continue this research because I feel like there are so many holes in why it's not being used right now at the collegiate level because um, athletes sometimes lose scholarship money due to 
a slow recovery time and using platelet plasma could be an option to possibly speeding this up and bringing the athlete back on the field safely. Um, why is it not used at colleges more? There's not really an answer. It's sometimes used and it's just interesting to see if like maybe it's budgeting costs because platelet plasma treatments cost around $750 to $800 and it could just be that it's too expensive for colleges. So I definitely want to look into the fact if colleges aren't using this option of healing because they feel that they want to use a cheaper one. But would the cheaper option be better or would the platelet plasma be better? It's definitely hard to say right now. And then will platelet plasma have an effect when the athlete gets older? As of the research I've done now, it won't have any effects. So it's unclear to why that this isn't being used. And I'd like to continue to prove that it should be used more and that it could be cost effective in the long run. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question. So um, can it heal ligaments or just joints? It can heal ligaments. I was- For real? Okay, so like, I can bring this up to my um specialist about it, all right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's um, especially used on like ACL tears, meniscus. It's just because that's like a big injury that usually takes an athlete a year to heal. It's still such a big injury that definitely needs that long time, but the platelet plasma will just help it heal a little stronger than if it was just healing on its own, just because the platelet plasma is isolated from the body, which is what is used to help the body heal. Okay, and do you know its application on shoulder injuries? Do you it have any is, data on that? Okay, it's an injection, so. Right. Yeah. So, okay, so it can be used in shoulder injuries? Yes. Okay, thank you. Why do I have a feeling Joey's gonna be asking his doctor about this? <laughs> I think Dr. Hawkins would be really interested in studying all the growth factors in there. Yes, I would. I bet there's a lot of them. Yes. You, you can work with us, Allison, do some science. Yes, <laughs> I'd definitely be open to that. Wow, just got stolen away from Jake. <laughs> <laughs> we had actually, that's something that uh, Allison and I had discussed recently, and she wants to pursue this research, and I was going to get up with a scientist and, and handle the science part of it, which I am not familiar with. Yes. So that's good to know. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Allison? Okay, I'm um, going to go, go ahead. It's a great job, Allison. Oh, thank you. Excellent job. Wonderful. So now's the time to introduce our last two speakers. Um, they're actually students that are working with me. And this project sort of came out of a paper we saw, it was very interesting, but it's Kira Wickham and Kocha Upadaya. And they are going to, I think they have a video they're gonna show and then they're, they're able to ask, answer questions from you guys. Hello, my name is Kocha Upadaya and this is my partner Kira Wickham. We're presenting our project on alkaline and endocrine expression and the anti-nine success on dry output. For some background information, we developed our project after reviewing our advisor's past research on the proteins involved in angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the process of blood vessel formation. And after further investigation, we discovered studies that have linked these the same proteins and protein receptors involved in angiogenesis to neural outgrowth. We specifically discovered their crucial role in the hippocampus region of the brain and memory. These same proteins and protein receptors have been linked to the development of Alzheimer's disease. Kosha will tell you more about the purpose of our experimentation. The purpose of our experiment is that it leads to greater understanding surrounding the anti and protein receptors, alkaline expression in neurons, and we can also further our understanding on both of these links to neuron outgrowth, function, specifically in the hippocampus, and memory loss. If we find that there is no association with the anti-9 after our experimentation, we can then understand that we must refocus our attention to another protein of the PCS rate of things. To begin our investigation, we plan on testing the positive and negative correlation between neurons and DMT9 
using a Nashville neuro outgrowth assay. The assay will allow us to measure the length and overall growth of the axons in dendrites and neurons. If we are able to associate DMP9 with neuro outgrowth, this will open up our investigation to questions regarding the TGF beta protein family, including ALK1 and endosome. Kosha will now discuss other plans we have regarding our project. We can test for the expression of ALK1 and endoglin protein receptors in neurons through the reverse transcriptase polyromerase gene reaction or the quantitative RT-PCR. It functions to monitor and target specific proteins within the cell. In our experiment, we hope to compare the levels of ALK1 and endoglin expression in neurons with DMP9 positive and or negative association with neural outgrowth. From there, we can find a molecular link between DMP9 and ALK1 and or endoglin. We are really excited for this project. Thank you for listening, guys. If you have any questions for Kosha or Kira, please, please feel free to ask them. I'm just going to make one comment just to, to give you the perspective on this for everyone. This is actually very interesting because we knew these factors were involved in blood vessel formation, but I had no idea they were also involved in neuron function and possibly memory. And, and there, these proteins are reduced during uh, Alzheimer's, as they said. And there's a lot of evidence, I know the AMP instructors know this, that we all know that blood vessels always grow alongside nerves. And so why is that? And, and could these proteins play a role in that process? So this could be very interesting. And I don't think a lot has been done on this. So I, I'm really anxious to see what Kira and Kosha come up with on this project. We're gonna work on it some more this summer. Any questions? Okay, any questions? Well, um, let's do a wrap up then. Um, I, first, I wanna congratulate all the speakers. I think they did all an excellent job. I wanna give them a hand. Congratulations to all the speakers. Great job. You did wonderfully. No matter, no matter what your topic was, it was all very interesting. You were all very well poised and you explained your topics very well. I was very, very well impressed with, um, with all the students and the projects, the diversity of projects that we saw. And, and also I, I express my extreme gratitude to all the faculty mentors that help these students in their projects. Also a huge thank you to Tasha and Christian for helping us put this on. You guys are so great and we could not, literally could not have done this without you. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Thank so, you guys. Does anybody wanna make a final comment about anything? I just, I wanted to say thank you uh, to you, Jim, and also to Amy for putting this together. And I found the presentations to be informative and engaging. And I, this is a great idea. And I hope that we continue to do this, you know, every spring semester. That is the plan, Kate. That's what we hope to do. And I like to recruit more students in more different disciplines. So more, so I want humanities to catch up with science and have more humanities presentations. And, and also other disciplines across the campus as well. I'd like to say one real quick comment, Amy, really just really quickly. We had some administration. So for the students that were presenting, I just want you to know that there was administration faculty that weren't your mentors, but that logged in and took part of this showcase. So to all the student presenters, to all their mentees or mentors, I'm sorry. Um, Thank you so much for all this work. You really have made a difference here at South Florida. And as this is the last UGR forum of the spring semester, um, I wanna say thank you for everyone who participated in that. Uh, thank you to also Keith Cavito, Dr. Cavito spoke, um, did a whole um, UGR forum. So thank you, Dr. Cavito. We'll have you back next year if you don't mind. Um, and we would like to continue this next year as well. So I will be sending out more emails. It'd be great if we could maybe get back to face-to-face -face in the fall. If not, we'll keep doing the Zoom format. But this is the last UGR forum of the semester. Um, plus it's on Earth Day. So we thought, you know, Science Earth Day be a great way to end the UGR forums on Earth Day with a, an assessment showcase. Um, so that's gonna wrap up this year's UGR and um, 
thank you guys so much for attending. And next fall, we will we'll start them back up. Right. Congratulations, everyone. Great job, guys. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.